Uh, that is about when you have uh, specifications uh, with some orders among them, uh, how do we synthesize the rule, right? Uh, this lecture will be uh, in a different direction from that in the sense that what would be the right formalism to uh, specify the rules, right? Um, this is the work uh, done when I was with Active uh, with my colleague, uh, Andrea uh, Chensi, uh, Kostya Snusky, James Fu, and uh, Emilio Frasoli. Um, just uh, for the safety purpose, uh, let, let me first state that whatever I, I would say uh, is, is my own opinion. Uh, so the company uh, does not have uh, uh, anything about this and that all the experiments are sort of for illustration, right? It does not necessarily represent what we really did with our own car. All right, so that's just the, uh, for the formalism part, uh, let me uh, start uh, as a recap of what we talked about. Uh, so for those of you who have been in formal methods uh, domain, right, uh, we learned that there are two key elements uh, to apply formal methods. One is a, a mathematical description of the model of the system. Right? So uh, that describes what are the possible behaviors of the system. But on the other hand, we also require what we call specification. And this describes what are the desired behavior of the system, right? So on one hand, you have all the possible behavior. Uh, on the other hand, you have desired behavior. You know, some desired behavior may not be possible and some possible behavior may not be desired. And in the end, we just want to uh, get what is the intersection between these two, right? This is just the high level description. But specification is a key element, you know, in, in, in pretty much from all the formal methods uh, based approach, right? Both in terms of specification, uh, in terms of verification and synthesis. Um, so how do we derive specifications, right? Um, at the first glance, uh, it might seem that specification is uh, easy. Uh, we even had some work, uh, you know, we, we published a paper where we uh, describe all the rules from DAPA Urban Challenge uh, 2007 uh, to LTL, right? Um, and we showed that that is possible. And, uh, you know, we used to be quite confident that with that, then we can apply typical formal methods and, you know, the world will be beautiful. But when we really get into the detail, uh, you, you see that it's not so trivial, right? Uh, we usually draw sort of this analogy with, I don't know if anyone heard about this kind of two steps to draw an owl, right? The first step is you draw two circles, right? So that sounds simple. Then the second step say, draw the rest of this owl, right? And, and this is almost like when we talk about behavior specification, because most people will say, oh, it just have to be safe, lawful, Right? The rest you figure out what, what to do with, what, what does this safe and lawful mean? Right? So uh, let me try to first uh, describe why, what are the challenges here? Right? Uh, the first uh, challenge that we encounter is um, that, you know, specification could be, uh, so there are cases where we cannot satisfy all the traffic rules. Right. What I mean by traffic rule here is not just law, but often it includes, you know, legislation, uh, comfort, ethics, um, local driving cultures. Right. So I, I would just call all these components uh, as a generally as a rule. Um, and there are cases where not all the rules can be satisfied. Right. The first example I want to give here is uh, you can see that uh, we have this is our autonomous vehicle. Uh, this is a, a parked vehicle, a stationary uh, parked vehicle. Uh, and here we want to turn left at this junction, right? The rules say that we should not change lane near intersection, right? And also it's not desirable to uh, have a sh abrupt turn uh, to, to, to change lane, right? So now you sort of have two different extremes where you can imagine what the car could do. Uh, the first extreme is we have a very smooth uh, trajectory with a gentle uh, lane change, right? But that would mean we 
change lane quite close to intersection, right? Like in this case, for example, right? This, this is one of the case where we actually implement minimum violation planning online. So you can see that, you know, the path actually changed because of the incremental nature. Uh, and at the end, we get a really smooth path right, to change lane, but then we change lane very close to intersection. Another extreme of the behavior is that we try to change lane as far away from intersection as possible, but that would mean that uh, we change lane very abruptly, right? Really close to this car, right? Um, so again, applying minimum violation here, you just change the order of the rule and you will get this kind of really tight uh, lane change uh, maneuver, right? The question is, which one of these, and there, there are a wide range of uh, behaviors right, between these two extremes. What is uh, acceptable? What is desirable? Right? So that's, that's the first question. And uh, you'll be surprised that it's, it's not easy to answer this. And, and different people have very different preferences of what is the right way of doing this. Right? So that's, that's the first uh, challenge. Uh, give me a minute. I thought I have another video. Okay, or well, maybe I did not. Okay, anyway, so um, that's the first case. Um, another case is also uh, in terms of uh, term formalization. Um, so this is the, the second challenge. Uh, this came from uh, the real example when we try to understand what is the right way to turn on the, the, the turn indicator, right? Like a turn signal uh, that you should, let's say, turn on the left turn signal when you are about to turn left and right turn when you are about to turn right. Uh, interestingly, uh, it, it's not, it, this, this problem is not that trivial, right? Especially in, in, in the legislation, um, it, it, it is described very vaguely. Now, after you know, some rounds are going back and forth with uh, regulators. This is a more precise description that we got, right? The first one said indicator should be activated after the previous turn has been passed. The second said the indicator should be activated at least three seconds before initiating a turn. The third one said the indicator should be activated at least 30 meters before the turn is made, right? How many of you think that this is clear? This is obvious what it means. Okay, so actually when we first uh, saw this, we, we thought that, oh, it, it looks quite nice. It, it seems pretty clear, right? But uh, as it happened, different people really evaluate this in a different way, right? Let, let me try to describe what, what could be challenge, challenging here. First of all, what do we mean by previous turn? Right. Is it a turn that we actually made or the turn that we could have made? Right. Uh, let's look at this example. Here we are turning left at, at the first junction below here. And later we plan to turn left again here. Right. When we are about to turn left here, is this left turn considered previous turn in, 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 in our case? Right. We, we, we don't intend to make this turn. Right. But there's some potential that we could have made. So what it, the question is whether this is considered a previous turn. And potentially it, it, it could mean that uh, it's the turn we could have made. Now, the second question would be, what do we mean by we could have made a turn, right? Is that only consider physical constraints? Like if you have the road barrier or the logical constraint, like the lane direction uh, is also taken into account. Right. So there are like, you know, questions like this that, that we have to answer to evaluate what this simple term, previous turn, mean. Uh, same thing for other keywords, like initiating a turn. Right? We have a continuous trajectory here. Where exactly along this continuous trajectory is the place where we are initiating a turn? Right? And the same thing, you know, a turn is made. What, what does it mean like along the trajectory? How do we say that this is the place where uh, the turn is made? Because, you know, most likely trajectory will be quite smooth, right? So um, these are the, the two uh, challenges. Uh, 
there are also other challenges. Um, for example, um, oh, actually, I'll, I'll describe this next. So another thing is that the traffic rule is often incomplete, uh, meaning that there are certain desired behaviors that are not explicitly stated. So uh, an example would be that um, you know uh, staying within a lane, but uh, you know sort of having some oscillation within lane, that is clearly not desirable. Uh, but it's never stated anywhere within traffic rule, in, as in legislation, that uh, such behavior is not allowed or, or not acceptable. Right? Uh, a lot of traffic law as in legislation uh, is based on assumption of the rationality of a human uh, behavior, uh, the, the, the rationale of human being more than 18 years old, right? And we need to really understand what, what, what that kind of uh, rationale means. So informal methods, right? Um, you know, when we define transition system, there are all these components. And I would say that we don't even know what are the atomic propositions here. And how do we define a map uh, that, that map a state to uh, a, a atomic proposition. Uh, even something that sounds very trivial, like uh, stay within lane, right? You would think that, oh, that sounds so trivial. That's what I thought too. So it sounds very trivial, stay within lane. You have lane draw, drawn as a polygon, right? Uh, you also have the footprint of the car that you draw as a polygon. Uh, stay in lane sounds like it means that the car footprint remain within the lane polygon. Right, uh, but there are a few corner cases that that is not quite a case. For example, uh, when when the lane is really narrow, right, and you have a bus that could barely fit within this lane. Um, if you ask anyone whether the bus actually violates the stay in lane uh, rule, nobody will say it it does. Right, um, so we have to really figure out what it means to 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 really stay in lane. Uh, this is this is a quote uh, from you know Colleen uh, and a few others uh, you know, big, big names out there. Uh, you know one of the first paper on on this kind of symbolic planning. Right? So even though automatic automatic control of robots and teams of robots from high level specifications, given that formulas of some temporal logic is useful and possible, there are several fundamental issues. Uh, I, I would claim that there are even more fundamental issue than, than this description because we typically don't even have a high level specifications given to us. This is something we have to figure out ourselves as well before we can apply formal methods at all. Uh, let me pause here. Uh, does any of this uh, make sense? Any questions so far? So one, one question was there, uh, Nock, that, you know, la last time you treated the vehicles as stationary and, you know, you said you refresh fast enough that planning took care of the dynamic nature. So yep. what if the vehicle wasn't parked, you know, but was thought of as stationary? You would, yeah. So so just like the uh, motion prediction of other, other vehicles, is, is, you know, is that taken into account or you just treat that as part of like your high refresh rate? Oh, uh, well, when we do the uh, minimum violation planning, right, we need to have, we need to understand how each vehicle is going to evolve, each agent in the environment is going to evolve. Uh, so we cannot, I mean, you can say that one possibility is that each agent always remain at the same place, right, when you construct the whole environment. Or another one say that they keep the constant speed. Um, or you might have some more complicated uh, model. Uh, yeah, but you, you, you need to know how it's going to evolve. Right? You, you, you cannot just say, okay, initially it is stationary. So, so that brings into account like, you know, how much uh, effort uh, do you think we, you know, someone should, should spend in modeling the other agents in terms of their how rich should their dynamics be? How how well understood should their driving policies be? Or could we just mm -hmm. have like a simplified, you know, assumption about them and continue? Yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, prediction is, is a critical component, 
uh, of this. Yeah. Okay. Also, it's a very hard problem as well. Okay, All right. guys, other questions? Ask ask questions. You have you have the world so expert on this topic here. So, okay. Um, I had a quick question actually. How does how how does the car differentiate between an illegal parked car uh, close to the intersection versus just traffic being backed up? Yeah, uh, this is this is also kind of like the the prediction uh, element, right? Um, you could try to differentiate. So I think it depends on your your classification algorithm, right? You could explicitly classify stationary vehicle from possibly moving. So when we say non-stationary, right, it doesn't mean that it's always moving, but it wants to move. It's just that there are some constraints that disallow it from moving versus what we call stationary uh, that are, you know, that it, it's just going to be there for a long period of time that there's no intention to move, right? And you could, you know, consider running some, this is like classification, um, um, problem, right? Whether given a car and the environment classify whether this car has intention to move or not. Okay. Yeah. yeah again, not, not a trivial problem. Uh, yeah, but there are certain, uh, characteristic of the environment you could tell, right? So typically park car are on one side of the street nearer to the curb, right? There's nothing in front of it. If there is something in front of the car, most likely, you know, it, it's not just uh, park, but in this case, it's just there alone, right? Most likely, you know, it's not just queuing, right? So there are certain characteristics of the environment that you can use to help with the classification. Okay. Thanks. Okay. And then I actually had another question. Um, is or formal method, since it's very logical, is it something that's like programmed in a prologue or is it typical like C++ or I guess, it, I mean, it doesn't entirely matter. I was just curious about. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so let, let me give a short answer without going too deep into detail. In formal methods, there are sort of two branch. Uh, let, let, let me see if I can find the lecture from last time. Um, let's see. So uh, sort of a very high level uh, drawing of what formal method is about, right? So you have two sides, uh, verification and synthesis, right? Uh, on the verification side, that means you have the model of the system and also some controller that you implemented, C++ or whatever, right? Uh, with that, you abstract it into a model of the system and then try to verify whether the system with this controller satisfy or violate the spec, right? That's, that's the verification. We call it formal verification. Uh, the synthesis is where you say, okay, you don't want to uh, implement the controller yourself, right? You, you have the model of the system, you have specification. Uh, synthesize automatically a controller that satisfy the specification. Right? Now, uh, controller in this case is typically some kind of you know, the, uh, what is it called? So typically you get, it is a function that takes in the state of the system and probably some history and the environment, right? And then output, what is the current control action? What should be the current control action? Yeah. So it's not really, I mean, and, and then you can implement this in any programming language. Okay. Uh, so let's let's move on. Uh, so that's about formal methods. Now, okay, this is a one slide recap of, of what we learned from from last time, right? Uh, minimum violation planning um, turns out to be quite practical in in especially in autonomous driving case because there's no invisibility, right? It it always um, uh, it always give a solution, right? The best solution that that it can find. Um, it's particularly useful in case of autonomous driving because as I showed earlier, right, there are cases when not all the traffic rules can be satisfied, right? But the car still have to act. The car has still has to do something, whether that means it has to stop. I mean, it has to do something, 
right? Uh, even stop that, that still means that it has to stop. Uh, so it has to evaluate what would be um, the best option it could do given the current situation, right? So in this case, uh, minimum violation provide a, a useful and practical uh, formalism for, for this. Uh, and what it try to optimize or, or minimize is a cost function that represent the level of unsafety with respect to the given set of rules. Um, and these rules are ordered based on their priorities, right? Uh, and we use the standard lexicographical ordering uh, to compare the level of unsafety. Right? So th these are sort of the, the formula we, 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 we looked at last time in terms of defining what the level of unsafety means, right? And there are some uh, uh, reference here that you can take a look if you want to learn more. Now, rule books is a generalization of minimum violation planning, right? So to define what a rule book is, let me introduce some terminology. Uh, so first of all, uh, a realization is a world trajectory. Uh, what I mean by that is a trajectory is a sequence of states. And this is the states of not only the eco vehicle, but also everything around it, like whether it's other vehicles, bicycle, pedestrians, uh, traffic light, road condition, weather condition. So it's it includes uh, the, the state of everything that is relevant to, to driving, right? So that's a realization. A rule is a function uh, whose domain is the realization, right? And it returns uh, the, uh, the, the degree of violation of that realization. So a rule take in a world trajectory, right? And it returns how bad this trajectory is. Right, so that's that's a formalization of what we mean by a rule, right? It's not necessarily a temporal logic formula, right? We, we, we sort of generalize minimum violation planning this way. So now it could be any function, any mapping. It might not even be closed form, right? But it takes in a trajectory and return uh, the measure of violation. Um, so that's a rule, a single rule. Uh, and a rule book is a pre-order uh, set of rules, right? So in this case, between any two rules, there could be uh, three different ways of how you can describe their relationship. Uh, so the first case on the left here, this means when you have B point to A, so A is a rule, B is another rule, right? Uh, this means that A is more important than B. Um, so you would violate B to any amount at all, just to reduce uh, the violation of A by a little, right? So this, this means A is strictly more important than B. Uh, this A is usually at the very top of um, the hierarchy, it's usually uh, safety, right? So no collision, um, you know, saving humans life. And uh, at the bottom of the hierarchy is usually some kind of comfort measure. So that means you would break hard, right? You would break as hard as you can. Uh, that will uh, violate the comfort rule a lot. But if that helped with uh, reducing uh, the death, you, you, would, you would try to do that as, as best as you can. Uh, so that's the, the first possible relation. Um, uh, the second, uh, possible relation is uh, when A and B are incomparable, right? So this is the case, this is like in a partial order case. A pre-order is a generalization of partial order. Um, so uh, this is the case where A and B are incomparable. Uh, so whoever implement the behavior can choose uh, which one is more important, right? Uh, the last case is where we have A and B uh, on the same rank, on the same level. Uh, if you remember uh, from minimum violation, this means it is at the same level in the vector um, and there's some weight uh, between them, right? Okay, let, let me pause here and uh, uh, get any questions you may have so far. Any any questions? Uh, 
there was a question about second case. Oh, is the planner stochastic? Um, not necessarily. Uh, it can be stochastic, but you can. This just means that uh, I'll explain more in the next slide. But you could have like a base rule book, right, where you left A and B being incomparable. But in different uh, cities, you may prefer one behavior versus the other, right? Uh, so in that case, when you implement this rule book in city uh, C1, then you draw a line from B to A, right? And when you implement it in city C2, you can draw a line from A to B, right? You can also make planner completely stochastic. Right? You can um, um, choose any of this behavior. Um, and in that case, the planner will still satisfy the rule book. Does that, does that answer the, the question? Okay. All right. Uh, if not, uh, ask me again. I mean, how do you know when to stop, um, you know, adding rules? And, and, you know, I mean, also because if you add too many rules, then, you know, your the complexity of solving this also grows. And then, well, and then ideally, you should have all the rules, right? Otherwise, there are some rules that you are neglecting. I mean, in this case, I think computation should be of a less concern than, than being complete. Um, unless there are really certain rules that are just not important. Right. Uh, I, I, I don't have examples on, on top of my head now that you just think that, OK, this is not an important rule. We can discard it. Right. right? But uh, in most cases, I think the problem we have is the opposite, that we don't have the completeness of the rule. Uh, we will find some surprising behavior that when you check, it is optimal within you know, this specification. But because you forgot, for example, um, this oscillation in lane that I, I was mentioning, uh, it could be when you have a very narrow road, right? And the, the car try to squeeze in as much as it can to uh, stay within lane. And with some inaccuracy of drawing the, the lane boundary, right? It could cause this kind of swerving behavior, mm -hmm. uh, which is not desired and might be even more dangerous than, you know, just trying to drive smoothly and, and violate the lane a little. Right. So I think the problem we found is sort of more on the opposite side where we not where we don't have all the rules we want to enforce rather than specifying too much. But isn't it the case that you only really care about the safety one? Uh, I mean, you it, it's like explicitly a hierarchy, and so wouldn't you only really care about being complete in the top layer of the hierarchy? Well, um, it depends on what you mean by safety, right? You don't want a customer to sit in the car praying, right? And then in the end, at the end, you said, see, no collision, you are safe. Right? You don't want that. You also want customer to feel safe sitting in the car too, right? You, you might feel the same thing, like, you know, when you are sitting, okay, let me give example of Thailand. When I sit in the cab in Thailand, I, I pray for my life for the whole ride, even though in the end I was safe, but I wouldn't prefer sitting in a car like that, right? So, uh, I mean, same thing for autonomous vehicle. Um, we need to uh, people to, 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 to trust it and, and feel safe when they are sitting in the car, right? This kind of uh, swerving within lane, right? Even though it might not really lead to uh, unsafety in the sense that, you know, it's not going to run into anything, but it caused a lot of confusion to other drivers. Like, you know, the guy driving behind you, what is this car doing sort of, you know, swerving in and out of the lane? Right. People would just freak out and that affect uh, the safety of the traffic system a lot, even indirectly. Right. So, I mean, it, uh, when when we when I started thinking about this, I, I also have this kind of naive and simplistic assumption to the top one should be just safety. Right. And then the second layer is the law as described by legislation. And then the third level is like the culture, like driving culture. And then the fourth one is comfort, right? When you really implement this, you'll find that it's not as simple, right? A lot of this thing that is initially considered as comfort, it, it really affects uh, what we call open eye uh, safety also. 
Yeah. Another case where uh, it might be safe, but it just feels so unsafe in the car uh, is when you sort of accelerate towards an object. Right? Uh, whoever sitting in the car will not uh, like that and will not feel that it is safe. Right? This is also quite a challenge because it's, it's really hard to describe what this means. Right? Uh, mm -hmm. And it's different when you ask someone to close their eyes or open their eyes. So this is what we call it, close eye, open eye uh, issues. Yeah, I, I guess my point wasn't that the others are not important for driving well, but uh -huh. do they need to be described formally? Uh, do they need to be in this framework where it's you know true or not uh, that they're satisfied? They they sound more like I things see. that are optimization variables. Uh, uh, objectives. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I I think I agree with you. Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, I, I think I agree with that general description. Uh, any other questions? All right, so let's let's continue. Um, so, to specify behavior, what what what, what is Rubux? Uh, what can Rubux be used for? Right, the first one is what we can specify just partial specification, right, as a base for distinct jurisdiction. This is this is what I mentioned earlier, where you know you might have a base Rubux that looks like this example. Right, where uh, no collision is at the top. So recall that when you have an arrow from this one to this one, that means the, the end of the arrow is the more important rule. Um, so you may have no collision. Uh, clearance, so this means that no collision is more important than clearance. Uh, it is also more important than lane keeping. But between clearance and lane keeping, it's not clear. Uh, developer can choose to make one more important than the other, or vice versa, right? And part length is the least important uh, property, right? So we can have this as a base rule book, right? Now, when we go to, let's say, city A, right, or city, let's say, C1, uh, we might, the city, you observe how people like to drive. You might say that, okay, in this city, clearance is strictly more important than lane keeping. Right, so then we draw a line uh, from here to here. Um, whereas in another city, uh, the observed behavior might be different, right? In this case, uh, people in this city may uh, uh, prefer to keep within lane, right? So in this case, lane keeping is more important than uh, giving sufficient clearance, right? So both R1 and R2 still satisfy R0. Right. We can, as an implementation, it can pick any of this and R0 will be specified. And uh, we have uh, in the paper, if you look, uh, the uh, certain rules of refining uh, specification in a way that ensure that the original specification uh, is satisfied. So that means the refined rules is consistent with the original rule book. Right. Um, and uh, the rule books also induce orders on realization. So even uh, with the incomplete uh, rule books, right? So if we look at this case, right, we have, let's say, four possible trajectories that we can pick from, right? A is when we hit an obstacle. Uh, B is where the car sort of squeeze in within the lane. Uh, so it will violate the clearance rule, but satisfy the lane keeping rule. Right. C is when it gives sufficient clearance, so it satisfies clearance rule, uh, but violate the lane keeping rule. Right. And D uh, satisfies clearance, satisfies way better than C, uh, but it violates lane keeping more. Right. So in this case, uh, if we say that clearance and lane keeping are incomparable, uh, that means uh, so A is the worst trajectory, right? Because it, 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 it includes collision. So uh, it is the worst one. Uh, it's at the top here. Um, B and D are both uh, more preferable than A, right? But they cannot be compared. And we know that C is better than D, right? Because uh, it also satisfies clearance, but it violates lane keeping to the less extent, right? So you can see that this is this also uh, is a partial order. Uh, now, when we refine 
and make it a total order. Now we also have a total order on the trajectory. Right? In the case where we say that uh, uh, clearance is more important, uh, then trajectory B will be worse than uh, D and C. Right? So we would prefer C as the optimal trajectory. And after that is D and then B and A is the worst one. Right, so this is the case where we think that clearance is most important. Um, the case where uh, we say that lane keeping is more important, right? In that case, we'll say that uh, B is the most preferred trajectory, right? Because it stays within lane and does not violate uh, uh, collision, right? And then C will be the next preferred trajectory, and then D and then A, right? So the rule books uh, would give uh, induce an order on on the realization right uh, so given a base rule books uh, we can refine uh, so the priority refinement is what is happening here in this example uh, we can aggregate rule uh, so what it means is for rules that are in the same level like in in this third case uh, we can combine them into one rule uh, with some weight between them and uh, augmentation means you can add a rule at the bottom of the hierarchy and it would not change anything. Uh, it's still compatible with, with the original rule book. Okay. So uh, that's sort of the, the framework. Um, so this is, this is sort of where ethics and liability could be captured within this framework. Right? There could be this hypothetical uh, scenario right, uh, where, um, you know, for whatever reason, this is our autonomous vehicle, there are two other vehicles that drive towards it. It has some speed, right, so it cannot stop immediately, right. Now, it could have two options. Uh, one option is to, so in both cases, it will break as hard as it can, but still collision cannot be avoided, right. In the first case, uh, it will not be at fault, right? It would hit this guy uh, at a higher speed because this distance is, is shorter than the rate trajectory. So it would hit at a higher speed, but not at fault. Uh, another option is that it could swerve, right? In that case, it would hit this uh, vehicle instead, um, but at a smaller speed, right? Because uh, this distance here is larger, so it has more distance to, to slow down, right? So in the case where we think that we prefer uh, no so we prefer to not have collision at fault, right? In this case, we would pick the green trajectory, right? Would collision happen is worse than than the red trajectory, but at least we are not at fault. Uh, the second case uh, would be where we do not differentiate between at fault or not at fault, right? and we would pick uh, the red trajectory. Um, the famous uh, trolley problem can also be formulated with the same uh, 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 formalism too, right? So it depends on exactly what you want to optimize. You can put this objective into the hierarchy. Um, so Singapore um, actually sort of adopted, uh, recently they, they announced uh, what they call the technical recommendations uh, for AV, it's called TR68. Um, and uh, the, the goal is to make this the, the standard for at least for Singapore and they probably try to push it to, to the rest of the world uh, as well. Uh, and it encodes this idea of minimum violation planning and rule book. So they recognize that uh, traffic rules cannot be satisfied at all time, right? And um, industry, researchers, uh, government, regulators should get together to really define what is the right behavior. Um, so, uh, for example, right, in, in let's say the, the trolley problem, um, right now it's a, you know, open philosophical problem. And, you know, when I give interview, people ask me about this, what should autonomous vehicle do? Um, I think my response to that would be, it shouldn't be up to a company to decide, right? A better approach would be to let the society decide together as a community, 
right? I mean, Singapore and U.S. may decide to adopt different uh, practices, um, but at least people should agree, right? And shouldn't left to court to decide by case by case basis, right? We have sort of we need a systematic way to evaluate what is correct and, and not correct. So this TR sixty eight is sort of the first attempt to bring together, uh, you know, all the uh, relevant and necessary. Uh, partners to to make this happen. So so why why shouldn't it be decided on a case by case basis? I guess from your perspective. Well, be because when you develop, you don't know, right? And then it's up to one developer or a few, a handful of developers to decide this, right? And 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 you 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 implement it without even knowing what is the right thing to do. And, and this is why I, mean, I would almost argue that one of the reasons why it is, you know, the, the big delay in releasing the autonomous driving technology is because we don't know how autonomous cars should behave, right? And because we don't know, uh, it depends on, you know, you as a programmer, you write some code, right? And one day someone will sit in the car and uh, argue with you that whatever the car is doing is not right, right? At least in his opinion, right? Um, and try to pressure you to change. And if that person happened to be your boss, you might have to change it. And another day, some other person might come in and say, oh, that's also not right. He want to change it again, right? So without a common uh, uh, agreement on what is considered a good practice, it, it's just there's no correct answer and it's hard for the industry to to move forward I, I guess um i feel like this problem exists for human drivers currently as well um i, I, mean, I agree yeah, I, you I ride with somebody else and they'll, they'll question your driving and so on and so forth but the solution has been to look at the problem from the perspective of risk like what is the probability that the car crashes and then they charge you some premium per month based on that why shouldn't the standard be, you know, a statistical basis for evaluation rather than these very complex rules where we have to specify every detail of the world? I see. Uh, I, I see what you mean. So uh, the approach would be, you know, to launch autonomous vehicle as it is and then see how it performs compared to what human is doing now. Yep. And if it's better, it's fine. If it's not better, then... Back to then. the drawing board. <laughs> I, I, I think, I think I, my opinion is that the reason that nobody has released one of these cars is because nobody is within orders of magnitude of this human performance level. Uh, I, I think I, I agree with you. Yeah, um, there, there are many uh, challenges uh, here, right, in, in driving. How do you uh, predict uh, human driving? And because right now, I would say, one of the fundamental problem is also because the current traffic rule is not uh, uh, precise. And so, you know, each human just implement it in his own way, right? And that makes uh, prediction harder, right? Um, it also makes uh, uh, reasoning uh, about other behavior harder. Once we have a standard where we clearly specify what is the right thing to do. If you do it, then you are correct. The other party will be at fault. Um, then uh, it would really help uh, the industry a lot, right? It, it doesn't only help industry. It would also help human drivers. Now, when you drive, you cannot settle uh, things until you really go to court, right? So you don't even know when you make the decision, is that the right decision? Right, until accident really happen, and then you go to court to, to, to judge that. Mm -hmm. right? So my argument would be, if you really specify this up front, right, it would eliminate many of these problems. Right? It would reduce accident even for human drivers too. Does that, does that yeah. answer your question? Yeah. I mean, in, in, uh, in the AV case, you know, you are recording all the decisions before they are being made, as they are being made, after they are being made. Yep. So, so, you know, you have some kind of a way to replay the entire incident, right? The re reason that this is case by case is because, well, it really depends on the 
you know, angle of incidence. It depends on the gaps. It depends on, you know, how the other vehicle is, what, what violations that other vehicle is doing in, for you to make uh, a bad, uh, to, for you to be forced to make a choice. Mm-hmm. And, yes. and you, know, you could fail to make a choice. You could make the bad choice. You could make uh, what some would consider, you know, uh, so, so could we, you know, society is not going to give us this answer, right? So, uh, so, but because the society themselves don't know the answer and they would just say, well, it depends. And it depends is just like dot, 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 right? So <clears throat> could we sort of show, uh, and this is some of the discussions we've been having in the lab is that, you know, uh, in, in terms of like a, a post accident, you know, forensics, uh, you know, leading up to this case, this was the best information, this was the, the information I had and I mm-hmm. came up the best possible decision and yes. uh, so in order to argue in this case by case legal sort of uh, you know framework that uh, uh, the this is the best possible decision you could have had right so mm-hmm. yeah and i think no, that, there is nothing that to, to this this kind of rule book effort that to say that you know after even even though we have these rule books you know it depends on how, what information you knew. If you had a bird's eye view, and if you had a perfect clairvoyance as to what's going to happen in the next, you know, 10, 15 seconds, you would have made a different choice. But given what you know, this was, you know, you chose the best outcome, and therefore I, they, I, they should not arrest you. Yeah, I I, I think I, I agree with 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 all you said. Um, so. Sometimes we differentiate this, right? Uh, rule books, as it is written, it is evaluated, we call after the fact. So that means you have all the whole sequence of trajectory, right? Then you evaluate. Uh, the, the different formulation would be given all the history up to the current time, right? What would be the optimal decision at that time, not knowing the future, or only knowing some probabilistic or non deterministic uh, prediction of the future, right? Um, yeah. I, 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 I think I totally agree with that. Uh, another thing I, I, I also want to, to add is that um, right now, okay, so this framework will also allow you to, let's say when, so I, I imagine that when we first specify rule books, right, that there's no way that it will be complete, right? It will be far from being complete. But each time, uh, let's say bad things happen, accident happen, it goes to court and then the court decide who is at fault, right? We should fit it back into the rule book and add whatever is missing that leads to that wrong behavior. Um, and in that case, you know, the, the rule book will be more and more complete, right? And then it will help the society as a whole as well. So is there a way to check when you add a new thing? Does it make the specification like in- self inconsistent? Like, would, would that just be an incomparable branch that you would have? So it depends on what you mean inconsistent because rule books allow, I mean, there will be cases for sure, right? That we cannot satisfy all the rules, right? So if that leads to inconsistent, like, you know, this kind of uh, clearance and uh, staying in lane, right? Are they consider inconsistent? Um, I, I don't think so, right? I mean, there there are both rules that we should, you know, to our best effort, uh, satisfy them. Right? Yeah, I guess what I mean is, let, let's say that you have rule A and rule B, you add rule B, same level of the hierarchy, and you call them incomparable before you get a realization. Um, but it turns out that you violated A once and you went to court and you lost, and you violated B and you went to court and you lost. How do you put a ordering on them at that point? I see. Okay, so let me go back into, um, so there was this, uh, this is part of what we call specification refinement, right? So you add rules or you add a hierarchy between them. Uh, there are certain operations that guarantee that if you refine them in this way, it will be consistent with the original specification. So it, that, what that means is if we know from the original specification that trajectory T1 is better than T2, mm-hmm. right? When you synthesize based on the refined spec, that property will still hold. 
Yeah, so uh, short answer is if you if you refine the rule based on these operations, right? There okay. are some, uh, sorry, I didn't give the uh, precise definition of these operations here, but in the paper, they are like, you know, mathematically formulate what each of these operations mean. Uh, uh, in that I'll, case, I'll read the paper, yeah. Yes. Actually, I think that's, that's all I have for, for this lecture. It's, it's, uh, it's a pretty short one. Yeah, I thought I was having another video, but I cannot uh, find it. Uh, any questions when, when I'm trying to find that uh, video? So w what would you say are like, you know, some follow ons to this, this work, right? Both the minimum violation planning and the rule books, because, you know, some of the students will in the class will continue to do research on this and uh, I think it's very useful for them to get, you know, more exposed from, you know, beyond a classic robotics master's program of just, you know, knowing perception planning control and going and joining, you know, some company as a C, as a software engineer or some, you know, mechanical plus software engineer mm -hmm. that are able to then, you know, actually come up with, you know, looking at these, these like basically like a driving policy engineer, right, which is going to be right. almost like a job profile right so what would you say are like you know interesting sort of um you know like even like just master's level projects to look at i see um so i think for master project it might be interesting to for example we we show that uh rule books is a generalization of minimum minimum relation only allows certain class of specification right so that means only uh a very restrict uh uh, F, uh, the rule function, right? Uh, we could see how much, I mean, when we try to uh, implement, actually, let, let me uh, show uh, another video. I mean, this is, this is more real. I can find it now. Um, uh, let me see, I have to present. Uh, do you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, so this is the case where uh, it, it's like the, the, the drawing we, we, we did. Uh, we have, uh, this is illegal park car. This is our autonomous vehicle. Uh, so this is run, you know, autonomously, right? And we want to illustrate that uh, there are cases where it's not obvious, right? In this case, we have um, clearance to specify, uh, to satisfy. So the first one is we say that lane keeping uh, is less important, right? So the car would automatically perform this uh, maneuver. Uh, the second case is where we say lane keeping is more important, right? So in that case, automatically when we apply sort of minimum violation planning idea, uh, the car will try its best to squeeze in. You can see that the, the wheel just barely touch uh, the, the lane line. Um, Again, this is this is also running all in uh, real time uh, with all the perception, you know, uh, real time perception and, and everything. Um, so that, 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 this is one where uh, it's not exactly minimum violation as in the original formulation, right? Because it's not just whether it is satisfied or violate, uh, but we also want to put some measure also on how much uh, the rule is violated. Uh, I mean, this is consistent with the notion of STL robustness, right? And instead of, uh, you know, just trying to minimize the, the violation, which is just a function of the duration where the violation occur, we want to make that a function of the amount of violation as well. So I, I think that would be a, a good direction to, to explore, uh, essentially combining STL and uh, uh, minimum violation or if we can even generalize that to a, 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 a more general function of the rule, right? That is not necessarily temporal logic. Um, interestingly, if you look at many traffic rules, at least the way they explicitly state, a lot of them are quite simple uh, safety formula. So I think the complication does not come from the logic part. We don't even need the full power of STL or LTL to be able to specify them. But the challenge would be, how do we really interpret uh, the rule? Right? Like stay in lane, what does that exactly mean? 
Right. So I, I think th those are sort of the the remaining uh, challenges that that many companies are still trying to figure out. Yeah. What do you think about using something like rule books to specify rewards for reinforcement learning? And have you considered it? <laughs> uh, actually, indeed, uh, we, we we did. Now, my. Okay, de depending on uh, what you mean by reward. At, at some point, we even think about we should... Uh, so when we think about this robustness notion, right, it's not just uh, the amount of violation, but also how well you satisfy the spec, right? So for stay in lane, how, how well you stay within lane, right? As opposed to, you know, if you are uh, close to the lane boundary, you should get less reward. Right? And then if you are in the center, you should get more reward. Uh, we, we, we did have some, this, some of this idea. And the problem with that is then uh, the car try to, uh, what is it called? Especially when you have the hierarchy, right? It, it try to uh, uh, satisfy some rule so much that it violate other less important rules. Right. And uh, so I think what makes sense is to um, not give the reward when the spec is satisfied, but only uh, penalize uh, based on the amount of how much the rule is violated. So penalize based on the amount, uh, but for the but not giving the reward when the rule is satisfied because it would lead into over optimization problem. What about uh, for something like uh, learning to predict um, the other traffic behavior? If you assume that you know th this rule book is the the framework which they operate in as well, it adds some mm -hmm. structure to the the kinds of trajectories that you would expect from the other right. agents, like like something in Covernet, I guess. Uh, did that that work? Um, I see. Use there? Uh, we have not done that. We did, uh, uh, if you look at uh, one of the reference in the minimum violation planning, uh, let me see, where is my slide? Uh, in the, one of the reference in the minimum violation planning, we assume that uh, the other car also implement the same hierarchy of rule, and then it become the game formulation between yeah, two stack cars. Over. Yeah. It's a stack uh, so, over game, right? Right, right. So uh, that's that's uh, that's one thing we we have uh, looked at the computation. Uh, you know, you can imagine it blow up <laughs> yeah. quite easily. Um, so it's I still guess, quite far from being able to implement it in real time. I, I guess one of our thoughts is that a lot of the complexity in planning comes from the fact that it's often the case that the the other cars around you don't have the same hierarchy of rules. Um, and that, that's I, I, where I the misunderstandings yeah. from those mismatches in our viewpoints is what causes uh, bad predictions about what will be safe and what won't be safe. So uh, I, I, the I, game I, thing I, is very intractable, but I don't even think it's the right formulation. Uh, I, I totally agree with everything you said. Um, you, you are absolutely right. Uh, the, the, the major challenge right now is because uh, it's so hard to predict other... Uh, behaviors and part of the reason I tried to argue earlier is because the rules are so vague people evaluate it yeah. in totally different way so I think that making rules more precise will really help with this situation it will make prediction uh, easier um, and once prediction is easier then you know it's just easier to do uh, everything else after that yeah I think that can work in some countries. I'm not sure how well it will work in the United States. People don't don't follow the rules here. <laughs> I agree, but um, you know, once you have better law, I mean, you know, once law is more precise, right, and you have better enforcement, uh, then it's it's harder to argue. Like right now, because things are so ambiguous, right, you can try to sort of get your way out of it. And, you know, people are not too keen to hire a lawyer to go to court and so on. Now, if it is so easy to judge that what you are doing is bad, right? And you even have yeah. automatic way of detecting that when you just look at the, you, you impose like cameras everywhere, right? And the camera can automatically detect when rule violation happen, 
then I think in that case, uh, most users will behave much nicer. <laughs> How how easy is it to monitor these rules rather than plan with them? Like let's say, uh, from from a like dash cam perspective, if I put a dash cam in somebody's car, right? Is it uh -huh. easier to monitor than it is to plan? Well, okay, I, I think monitoring is much easier because now you have uh, a single trajectory, right? And you just have to say yes or no. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, for planning, what it means is you have multiple trajectories, right? That you either have to generate yourself, and in the end, you have to pick one, mm -hmm. right? So if if you can solve uh, the, the 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 planning problem, then definitely you can solve the verification problem, right? For because verification mm -hmm. is just you have one trajectory, and you just have to decide whether it is yeah. correct. Yeah, I guess from my perspective, uh, hitting people's pocketbooks via insurance is probably the only way to, to get more sophisticated rules uh, to be codified um, in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, it's, it's even worse in Thailand, I would say. <laughs> um, anybody else in the class have more, more questions? I'm sort of taking up all the time. Okay, now, so this was great, I think. And thanks a lot for, again, taking us, you know, uh, further in terms of really understanding, you know, more of how these systems should behave or how to encode this behavior efficiently. So uh, thank you. We'll uh, stop the lecture at this point, and then uh,